Um, <laughs> so I'll explain shortly what I mean by uh, a moment of moments, but um, I want to firstly focus on uh, what I mean sort of by looking at moments of random, uh, so uh, yeah, random matrix polynomials. So it's a heavy board, I should have worked out beforehand. <laughs> So I'll shortly define what I mean by this, but I should first say as well that all of this is uh, joint work uh, with Theo Asiotis and John Keating. So uh, I'll be concerned with three sort of classical uh, random matrix groups. So for notational purposes, uh, we say that U of N is the group of uh, unitary N by N matrices such that their uh, conjugate transpose uh, is their inverse. Uh, and then we have the group of uh, symplectic uh, even matrices, matrices of even dimension, uh, such that they, so these are also unitary matrices and they obey an extra uh, criteria that if you conjugate this special matrix omega, uh, it remains uh, invariant where this is the matrix omega. Great. Uh, and then finally we have, uh, I'm going to put here the special uh, even uh, orthogonal group, which again are 2 by 2, uh, 2 n by 2 n matrices. Uh, that are orthogonal and the extra condition is that they have a uh, unit determinant. So something uh, to comment firstly, they're all uh, any matrix in any one of these groups has its eigenvalues on the unit circle, which is important. Great, so uh, and I will denote by uh, G of n is going to be any one of these groups. Okay. So I should firstly say what I mean uh, by a moment. So uh, a classical uh, moment that one would study is something like the following. Uh, so let's say uh, G of n here. Uh, where, so uh, this average is with respect to the, the Haar measure on the relevant group Gn. Uh, Pn uh, is the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A. As I said, these, uh, determin uh, these um, matrices have their eigenvalues in the unit circle, so these polynomials naturally live there, which is why I've written the... the, um, the uh, um, Invari uh, variable in the Kashtich polynomial in this form. So you think about theta being real. So then uh, this would be a moment. So we'd want, uh, for example, you probably want, you could take beta complex, but to make sure the problem is integrable, stay away from minus a half. So uh, these moments were addressed uh, in the work of Keating and Snaith. Uh, firstly, for unitary, so that's how I state it. Uh, so Keating um, so let's take uh, the unitary matrices and their result um, uh, extends to or complex beta away from where I said the problem uh, should be integrable then they have a complete closed form so for finite n we have that The two beta moment of the characteristic polynomial uh, has the following uh, finite closed form. This is the, the gamma function here. Uh, absolutely. So this is uh, completely yes. Uh, so this was proved, that's my next sentence, so uh, this was proved via the Selberg integral, absolutely. 
um, which gives you this beautiful <laughs> result. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, I sure will. Pay the Um So, uh, as uh, we have this lovely result of uh, Via Salberg, uh, by Keating and Snaith, we have uh, a closed form which gives you obviously uh, an asymptotic form. Uh, so, as n gets large, this behaves like n to the beta squared. When we know, obviously, exactly the form of the c sub beta, this function, where the function c sub beta is a ratio of Barnes g function. So let's do script g here to distinct, make it distinct from the matrix group g of n. So uh, in particular, when beta is an integer, um, we have the uh, property um, uh, when, so this is for... Uh, integer beta, uh, this number here is integral. Um, so uh, I should also comment, it's not necessarily obviously immediately clear from this definition, uh, so this uh, identification here, but this right-hand side is actually a polynomial in n as well. So it's a polynomial of degree uh, beta squared when beta is an integer. Okay. <coughs> I think that was what I wanted to comment on that. So um, I now want to move on to uh, uh, so uh, philosophy, a series of conjectures that started with, uh, uh, I'm sure many of you know, the conversation between Montgomery and Dyson, inferred notably by Katz and Sarnak, um, and also further evidence was given via the Keating and Snaith work as well, uh, which uh, can view these moments here somehow in a statistical sense, modelling moments of uh, number theoretic functions. So, in particular, I want to introduce uh, three families. So, uh, look at three examples. So, example one is, in some sense, the canonical example of the Riemann zeta function, which I'll write in a, in a family of some sense. So you can think about this as being a family with a partial ordering by uh, T, uh, where, just to be super explicit, we have the Dirichlet sum to the right of 1. And in this sense, uh, what would a moment be? A moment would be something like the following. So you take a long portion of the critical line So you look at an average like that. So uh, there's a, a well-known conjecture about how this should behave. So as t gets large, uh, you should have some uh, leading order coefficient terms which depend on beta, and I've se separated out for a reason I'll mention in a minute. And the main term should be like log of t over 2 pi to the beta squared. So I'll make a few comments on this. So, uh, so A sub beta uh, contains all the arithmetic information. So it's essentially just a, an Euler product over primes. The second part of the, the leading order coefficient uh, is a bit more mysterious. So not necessarily explicitly given. Uh, we do know uh, some information on these moments. So the case of beta equals, okay, zeros, it's trivial. Uh, beta equals one and beta equals two. Uh, it's handled by Hardy and uh, Littlewood. Uh, and then Ingham for the fourth moment. And then there are, um, for the sixth and the eighth moment, uh, fairly precise conjectural forms of what you should expect. Uh, you see sort of this term happening due to uh, Connery and Gosh and Connery and Gonick. Uh, so this is conjectural, not proved. Both of these are conjectural. These are proved. 
Uh, we also have, uh, so we know uh, lower bounds unconditionally of the right size. So we see the log t term, but we don't see the, the coefficient. So lower bound of right side uh, due to um, uh, Heath Brown and Ramachandra. Um, and we have uh, upper bounds again to the right uh, order, but under our H now. Uh, so uh, sound got a beta squared plus epsilon, uh, which Harper then removed the epsilon. So is lower bound for all beta or? For all, uh, at least all real uh, non-negative beta. Yes, it might be stronger than that, but I, I believe that's true. Okay, so we have uh, so the the main order term. Um, so uh, that's the first family uh, that I want to consider. Uh, so it's Riemann zeta function. I'll say a little less about the other two families, but uh, I will mention them now. So uh, example two. Uh, it's a family of uh, quadratic Dirichlet L functions. So uh, here, a family with the L point uh, L function at its symmetry point, uh, where chi sub d of n uh, is the um, uh, Dirichlet character, um, uh, the quadratic Dirichlet character. So. Uh, the generalization of the uh, Legendre symbol in this sense, where uh, we want that D is a fundamental discriminant. So this is an example of a family. This family is ordered by the absolute value of D. Uh, so again, to be explicit, uh, to the right, of one. And then uh, the moment in this sense is not a moment up the line, but a moment through the family. So an example moment that one could consider here is the following. So when I put a star here, I mean I'm only summing over fundamental discriminants. This d is the length of this sum since we're not counting all D. And that will be a moment in this sense, so averaging through a family rather than up the line. And the final example that I will give which I'll say even less about, but uh, uh, family of elliptic curve L functions, in fact, twisted ones. So here, the family uh, would be, again, at the symmetry point. And I'll explain what I mean by E sub D in a second, uh, where D is a, once more, fundamental discriminant, again, ordered by the absolute value of D, where L of S E sub D can be written in the following way, where these, uh, these uh, coefficients a sub n are related to this elliptic curve uh, without the d, so this is some elliptic curve over q. Uh, these can be related to, uh, for example, when n is prime, related to the number of points uh, on that elliptic curve over the finite field. And then when I have a d, this is the, the fact it's twisted by this character, which is the same character as I described up here. Then once more, the moment would look similar to the quadratic case. 
stars once more denoting uh, fundamental only summing over fundamental discriminants. So uh, why these particular three families? Well, because they have are said to have um, symmetry groups which match that of van der matrix on top. So the Riemann zeta function is said to be uh, a unitary family. The family of uh, quadratic Dirichlet al functions is a symplectic. And that of uh, elliptic curves is orthogonal. In a sense that they uh, can be modelled in a statistical sense by uh, matrices and poly characteristic polynomials coming from uh, the matrix groups that bear the same name. So I want to touch briefly on, on what, what is the power of this. Why would we make that, this identification? Well, you can actually see it here before I rub it off. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, some power of this is uh, by looking through the lens of the random matrix object, which is said to model the family, one could possibly learn information. So this is why I've called these C sub betas, they match here. So the conjecture is that this random matrix C sub beta here, uh, average over the orthogonal, uh, the unitary family, should be the same as the C sub beta here in the Riemann zeta function. And it matches in all known cases and the conjectural cases as well. So you can, you can check numerically or what? So, well, uh, so these are the proof. So those you can prove. These you can prove. The conjectures give the C sub beta. It's, it's precise enough to give what you'd expect in that case. And they match when you put that relevant value of beta uh, into uh, here. Con Connery and Gauche made conjectures bare hands. Yes. So it's this power of, of using uh, random matrix theory, for example, in applications such as number theory. But my results I want to talk to you about, uh, which I'll tell you about now, uh, not only give uh, uh, conjectures in the number theory world, but have links to statistical physics, uh, to representation theory, and to combinatorics as well. So I'll highlight those as we get there. So, so you haven't gotten to your thought on the perspective yet, right? I mean, I, I understand the unit theory. Yes. But so, so the so. Analogous so yeah, you could replace this average here with the average over uh, uh, a matrix from the orthogonal or the yeah. symplectic group, yeah. and then there are conjectures here, and the results in the random matrix case should give you information about those be conjectures. In the cases here where you can't group there, you can group there. Yes. Yeah. So more moments than linked and okay. match. So uh, that was moments, so now I should tell you about moments of moments. <coughs> so uh, let's take a matrix from one of our groups. This is symplectic, orthogonal, or uh, unitary. Then we define uh, the moments of moments. These were defined in the UK, so this doesn't sound as weird there, but mom, uh, so g of n. And we have uh, two moment parameters, k and beta. So we do a moment of moments. And it's the following object. So 
So we're doing two different averages. So inside here, this is for a fixed matrix, A, and then this, this is a function on the unit circle, and so you take its average value around the unit circle. So this is for a fixed A. That is a random variable with respect to which matrix you take. And so you could average through the relevant matrix group with respect to the Haar measure. And this forms a moment of moments with the two moments parameters, K and beta. So there's a conjecture about how this should grow. Uh, so it's due to uh, Jan Fyodorov and John Keating. So K could be non-integer. Shortly it will be taken to be integer, but when I write it like this, you could take it non-integer. Again, beta should stay away from, from minus a half, but these are fixed values, and then we're going to analyze this as our matrix size grows. Yes, and it's going to grow, exactly. So conjecture uh, for fixed K and beta is the following. So the conjecture pertained uh, just to unit tree, so I'll state it to that for that for now. So let's take uh, our unitary matrix. So uh, should grow as the following. So this is as matrix size N is growing. So in the first regime, you have some leading order coefficient times N and the power is K times beta squared. And the regime, regime here is when K times beta squared is less than one. <coughs> in the second regime, and I'll explain why we might expect such a phase transition in the second, is when K times beta squared is greater than one. So we have a different leading order here and a different uh, leading order coefficient as well. So, so uh, can I ask a question? So are you, these are leading order uh, sort of asymptotic behaviors. Are you interested in either case in the next leading order or not? Yeah, we can be, and I can, my, our results okay. give you some, some handle on that as well. Uh, so as well as at the uh, sort of critical point in the middle here, you'd see something like n log n as well. I'll say that. Uh, in the conjecture, this is explicitly given. I won't write it down, but it's similar to the, the unitary case. This is a combination of uh, Barnes G functions uh, and gamma functions. So uh, explicitly given in the conjecture, whereas in the second case, it's just some complicated function of K and beta. Integral is absolutely no longer elementary. Uh, so the integral here can be handled by Selberg. So the, uh, in this first regime, this is uh, considered somewhat uh, easier to handle because you have Selberg there. And also, from this perspective, you have K fisher hartwig singularities, but they remain fixed and distinct. So you don't have to worry about coalescing. When you move into this... K fisher hartwig singularities? singularities. The second regime is where you're allowed to coalesce your fisher hartwig singularities. And in fact, that is why you sort of see this sort of different behavior, because these are coalescing. So this is why this is seen as a more difficult regime. So when it was uh, introduced, we didn't have a uniform fisher hartwig asymptotic for k-emergent singularities. So I'll comment a little more on this conjecture, and I'll give you our results. So, uh, comments. And this also has no material, uh, uh, so. Interpretation, I, I can give that in a second, yes. Uh, so, okay, uh, a brief comment. So, k equals 1 reduces back to the case of uh, Keating and Snicks. Um, so a second perspective. So why might you want to study such an object? <coughs> so uh, one, uh, one viewpoint would be to define something like the following. No, so uh, when you put k equals 1 here, you actually see that you just get an enter beta squared. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, if we define uh, the following function, so I'll call V sub N. It's going to be minus twice the logarithm of my couches polynomial. 
then the random variable inside my outer expectation, let's call it uh, z of beta. So to be explicit, this is what I'm considering. So this is for a fixed matrix. I can trivially rewrite it using my v function. The benefit of doing that is that on the right hand side here, it now takes the shape of a partition function for uh, a system with uh, energy or Hamiltonian given by V sub n and inverse temperature beta. So we can apply statistical physics techniques. So. So yes, this is, this is a four unitary case, but you could put, I'm, I'm specializing in a moment to the unitary case, but. So this is a uh, partition function for a system uh, with energy or Hamiltonian V sub n and uh, inverse temperature Uh, so this also gives you a perspective as to why you might see some sort of phase transition. You're, you're changing your temperature of your system and you have a different behaviour, which is sometimes why the uh, middle point here is called a freezing tra transition. Um, so uh, if you're a statistical physicist, the next thing you might do is consider the free energy, which I call f of beta. <coughs> Uh, which, let's check my annotation, should be uh, minus 1 over beta uh, times the logarithm of uh, z sub beta. And then uh, as uh, you can take the limit as beta grows large now, of your free energy, and you'll see that this is going to be dominated for when this v sub n is small, or in particular when this, this uh, Characters polynomial, the logarithm of it is big. So this is currently for for some fixed n. Fixed yes, n. at the moment. So uh, what I want to comment now is that uh, if you can get uh, enough information by studying the moments of moments for fine enough information for all beta you could get uh, good information on the maximum of the log of the characteristic polynomial. And this is a, uh, an object here, and it's a related counterpart in number theory. The maximum of the log of the zeta function in short intervals has been a uh, great study in recent years. So I just mentioned a couple of names, I guess. So, uh, so studying this and its number theoretic count, uh, counterpart, uh, see works of... Uh, Arguin, uh, Bellius, and Borgade, uh, Paquette, and Zaituni, uh, and Chaibi, Adol, and Nash Noodle. So this is dealing with the RMT case. So uh, the statistical physics aspect can give you uh, an information about uh, the shape of this, and these are progressively uh, fine results on uh, towards that end. And then also in the number theory case, uh, we have the uh, results of uh, Arguin, Bellius, Borgade, uh, Max, uh, and Sound, and then uh, progressively Harper. Uh, I should put Nudge Noodle in here as well. This is for when uh, you replace your P of n by uh, zeta. <coughs> yes. <laughs> the fact that you could uh, do anything for zeta unconditionally mm -hmm. or log of zeta for the, the distribution. Absolutely. The distribution of yeah. log of zeta is going to log log t. Yes, <laughs> by his, his <laughs> central limit theorem.
So I should now tell you our results. Uh, so firstly, uh, John and myself handled, uh, uh, partially handled the unitary case. So uh, we're going to uh, fix uh, some uh, integer moments, integer k and beta. Uh, then we have that our moments of moments in the unitary case take the following form. So we verify uh, partially that conjecture. Note that if we're integer, we have to line this uh, second regime, which is, from the perspective of Fisher-Hartwig, more, more difficult to handle. Uh, we also get a, a description of the leading order coefficient. And we further, this is touched on your point earlier, uh, we further prove it's actually a polynomial in N got extra structure. So you know it's actually a polynomial. It's actually a polynomial and we can prove that. Yeah, it always is. So for integer k and beta, it's a polynomial. Is that hard or is that something you just got to it? Um, yes and no. So interestingly, we've not yet found uh, a proof of the polynomial. So I'll mention briefly how we prove it in a minute. But the method of proof for getting the, the correct asymptotic is different for the polynomial, polynomiality proof. Okay. Um, so we always have to go down a different avenue yeah, to get this. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, the yeah, integration formula. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, earlier this year, uh, together with Theo Asiotis as well, uh, we deal with the uh, orthogonal and symplectic cases. Uh, then we have, so let's do symplectic first. Uh, so we have a different leading order coefficient. Let me call it uh, delta, so k and beta. And we have a different leading order behavior as well. Uh, where, uh, again, we can describe this leading order coefficient, but as I'll mention in a minute, the proof technique we chose to pursue is different, so we have a different perspective on on where this comes from. Uh, so for special orthogonal, again, it's like difference, so eta, so k and beta, and the power is similar, but we have a minus one. Except in one case, uh, in fact, the simplest case, when k and beta are both 1, uh, so it's twice n plus 1. And we can also prove these are two polynomials. So I, I don't, don't follow, sorry. Instead of taking that to the k, yes, yes. I separate the variables into different variables yes. and then take the expectation yes. and then specialize at the end back to, is that how you do it? Essentially, yes. We, we always use the fact we have integer k, and so we exchange order of integration. I'll comment on this in a second, but yes, yeah, that is in spirit how we do it. You know, all I'm saying then is there's a multivariable statement yes. under the polynomial. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Great, yeah, so I, want to, I do want to comment on uh, our proof techniques because there are uh, some beautiful combinatorics underlying them. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just about to comment on that. So uh, there are at least three, but I'll, I'll say three different ways you can get a handle on these objects. Uh, so techniques. So uh, all of these rely on the integrality of K. So we always exchange uh, and push our matrix average inside first. And all of there are different ways of interpreting that matrix average. So uh, firstly, you could <coughs> interpret it using uh, Conroy, Farmer, Keating, Rubinson, and Snaith multiple contour integral. So uh, uh, applying some uh, complex analysis techniques and pulling out the right order. So that's one way of viewing the problem. Secondly, absolutely, we can use representation, representation theoretic uh, approaches. Uh, and in particular, via the use of Gelf and Zetland patterns. And if time permits, I'll say some more about this. And thirdly, it's more of the fisher hartwig approach, uh, is using uh, asymptotics of uh, toplets and toplets plus Hankel determinants. So uh, this third approach is what uh, uh, so Cleese and Krasowski uh, managed to get a uniform fisher hartwig asymptotic for k equals 2, so for two merging singularities, uh, using uh, this uh, idea, which recently Ben Fars has extended to, to all integer k. Ben Fars, uh, Imperial London, I believe. So uh, Ben Fars has extended this uh, this approach. Uh, however, uh, it, whilst it does get so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the top regime is essentially handled by Selberg. The second regime, Ben Fars, gets the correct order, but no uh, explicit coefficient. So it's not strong enough. So these are for non-integer beta. I should I definitely should say that for real beta, both of these, whereas Cleese and Kozowski really get fine information about the leading order coefficient, in fact, related to Pen of A, FARS doesn't get uh, fine enough information to be able to induce information about the maximum and things like that. <coughs> so uh, uh, technique one is how we dealt with uh, the unitary case. So we used a multiple contour integral there and, and uh, handled that object, and that's how we got the right leading order out. Have a, uh, Does that stationary phase have an argument or, or not? Uh, I'm not familiar with that language, sorry. <laughs> you do use, I mean, one thing they learned over time was exactly to make these new variables and then uh, that, in all these moment things, that's yes. always much easier. Yes, you yes. So you do introduce several yes, no, absolutely, yeah, absolutely we do. Yeah, in both of these, actually, we, we can th send them separate, do some manipulation. Is, uh, what is the verb for doing that? <laughs> uh, Yeah. <laughs> sure, we'll take that. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that is, uh, at least in my humble opinion, less beautiful than this representation combinatorial approach. So I'd like to focus on that for the remaining time of my talk. So this is not to say that one cannot apply uh, approach two to uh, theorem one up there. And in fact, uh, Asiosius and Keating have done that. So you can show that you can uh, apply either one or two, certainly, to get either of our results. We chose two to get the symplectic and orthogonal case. So that's what I'll focus on now. So uh, first, a definition. So uh, a uh, signature 
lambda of length L is some uh, non-decreasing uh, sequence of integers. Uh, so some sequence of L parts such that each element is an integer. Uh, the uh, set of uh, such L long uh, signatures is denoted by uh, S of L. And the set of uh, L long signatures, uh, where additionally we require that lambda j uh, is uh, a non negative integer, is possibly more frequently called a partition, but we'll, we'll call the set uh, S of L plus. So if you take uh, two signatures, they can uh, interlace, and that's what I'll define now. So if we take uh, an L long signature and you a uh, L plus one long signature, then we say that lambda, uh, that was appalling, let's try that again, there we go, lambda interlaces with you if the following is true. They, they perfectly interlace. Uh, and in fact, we could take a uh, new and L long signature and then we just ignore that final inequality. So that's how two uh, signatures uh, can uh, behave together. And then uh, if we have a collection of signatures, we can form something called a half pattern. So if we take some natural number n, uh, then a uh, half Gelfand uh, Zetlin pattern uh, P, which is some collection of n signatures denoted lambda superscript i, uh, such that uh, two conditions hold. So firstly, we have to have the adjacent pairs have the same length. And in fact, have a length essentially half. And also that they all interlace. Uh, so first signature interlaces with the second, all the way up to the final one. And I'll draw an example of this in a second, which We'll make it a bit clearer. <coughs> but firstly, I want to give our final definition. So uh, I'll define uh, just a symplectic pattern. I'll comment on what an orthogonal pattern is and how it uh, varies. But let's just give a symplectic pattern. So again, take some natural number n. So. Uh, Symplectic patterns are always even, so 2n symplectic Gelfand Zetland pattern P. Uh, so we have 2n signatures uh, such that uh, every element is in fact uh, an element of a partition. So these are all non negative integers. So if we look at an example, uh, so uh, let's, I've chosen a half pattern of length four, so a half uh, so we have uh, four uh, elements, and we just draw it in a, in a triangular shape. So the first two um, signatures have the same length, they have length one. And the second two signatures also have the same length and have length two. And we draw it in such a way so that it's easy to see the interlacing. So we have this going on here. 
And if all of these entries were non-negative, this would be a symplectic pattern. The difference between symplectic and orthogonal is that these entries in the far left here, called uh, odd starters, could be negative as well in the, in the orthogonal case, which introduces further complexities. OK, so uh, let's point out how this is related to our moments of moments. Let's fear the work of Bump and Gambard. So we have the following proposition that we prove. Again, I'll just state it for symplectic, but we have a, uh, an alternative one for orthogonal. So uh, so for integer moments, our moment of moment, so uh, symplectic, uh, is equal to the uh, number of uh, Galfin, Zetlin, symplectic patterns with 4 times k times beta rows with uh, two constraints. So we have to have that the top row, i.e. in this picture here, the ones with 4 in the subscript, so top row, uh, lambda superscript uh, 4 times k times beta has to be uh, all our matrix size n. Uh, this is a 2k beta long vector. So it's the partition, uh, just uh, a rectangular partition. So that's to be that top row. And uh, there is uh, some extra we give explicitly, which I won't give here because they're a bit complex to write down. There are some constraints on, on the elements of the partition. And extra k, in fact, constraints. It's counting exactly, exactly, and um, which is why you should see polynomiality. It's why why these have, have a high structure. So on the uh, pattern elements, so I'll give a very brief example to make that a bit more concrete, so you can see how the um, extra constraints come in. So for example, uh, if you want to calculate. Uh, the simplest moment of moment for the symplectic case. This proposition says that that's equal to the following number. It's the number of uh, four long symplectic patterns, which have this shape, such that the top row is n, which by the interlacing forces this element here to also be n. And let's call these elements, let's say, a, b, and c. So it's the number of Galvin Zetlin patterns. So by the interlacing condition, we know that A, B, and C are also constrained to live between 0 and n. So I've now uh, encapsulated all of this part of the proposition, but there's an extra single constraint. And it turns out that the single constraint here is nice and simple, which is not true in higher dimension or higher values of k and beta, but it's simple here which just boils down to a very simple count, which even in my jet lag state I should be able to do. <coughs> so in, in simple cases, we can completely describe them. And in fact, for, for small moments of moments, we can compute the whole polynomial. So we give these as well in, in the papers where these results appear. When we go into higher values of k and beta, these row constraints become much, much more complex. Um, and so you can't deal with them by hand. Instead there, what you have to do is move from a very, this very discrete setting here into a continuous setting, and then uh, apply results on uh, counting lattice, lattice points in, uh, in convex regions. And that's how we get, we just get a hand on the leading order coefficient, 
And then your, your real problem is proving that uh, the leading order coefficient is actually positive, which we, we handle, but uh, it's non-trivial to do that. So how is going to continue <laughs> to help uh, enforce the constraints? So the constraints, are, so the constraints aren't too bad, but what the constraints give you is that the constraints really are here in the price that you pay. So this sort of top part here is what you'd expect for the normal moment, and this is what's sort of pulling you down with the extra moment. And this is sort of the K constraints that each one pulls like you down. Can I do this in the, in the continuum? You have some kind of continuous version of Yeah, so you can move into like a vowel chamber type thing. Okay. Um, and then uh, what that gives you is an ability to pull out the correct factor of N. And so you, that's fairly easy to, to pull out the, the correct size. Essentially by doing what I just said, you, this is what you'd expect and this is the price that you pay. And then you're left with determining the volume of, of some region left over. And showing that is non-zero is the... Is the Yes, just for the leading term, absolutely. Yeah, it'd be nice to be able to, it's unclear at the moment necessarily uh, how you push this to get subleading older terms. Though, uh, okay, this is uh, a belief of mine, not necessarily shared by my co-authors. I think you could possibly push one to get subleading as well, possibly. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll briefly, I'll finish now, but I'll just briefly say that uh, as I just commented, we can actually explicitly compute these polynomials for small values of k and beta. And they turn out to be really, really highly structured objects. So you always get a sort of increasing n plus 1 through to, say, n plus a, and then some sort of chunkier irreducible term, which, but whose roots also have a beautiful pattern <coughs> embedded in them. So there's more to understand, I really think, about these objects. And uh, finally, just to conclude, I'll say that uh, these results as well uh, lead you to various conjectures on moments and moments for the L function families that I mentioned at the start. So it'll give you the shape of what you'd expect, uh, what you'd have log of the length of your sum in place of n here. So I'll finish there. So thank you very much for listening.